Right now, we're going to go to the Malmore Football Complex in the campus of the University of Alabama. The athletic director at the University of Alabama, Greg Byrne, I hope you're having a great Friday afternoon. Welcome into the game in Tuscaloosa. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks for having me on. Hey, no doubt. And uh, we spent some time, and we've been talking about some things. And uh, you sent out the survey, and I said, I've got to reach out and get him on the show because uh, we've kind of did this uh, a couple of times, kind of asking what would improve and, and what ways and what adjustments. Talk about the idea that came about with sending out the survey to the greatest fans in the country. Sure, absolutely. Well, part of what we've been working on uh, for the past year is is a facility master plan and, and studying our facilities, seeing where our strengths are, maybe where some of our challenges are, and, and what the next steps are, are ahead. Because as a program, obviously, we have to continue uh, to improve who we are uh, as things change, things evolve, as things age. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And so... Uh, what we need to do, though, as we're working on those things, is understand, uh, even though we have somewhat of an idea already, but understand what's important to our fan base, where their interests are. Uh, we actually had uh, architects in for a couple games this year studying Bryant-Denny Stadium, studying Coleman Coliseum, looking at our facility footprint elsewhere. And so we, the, the next step that we felt we were at with uh, with looking at all these things is as make sure we get the, the right kind of feedback from our fans and understand what's out there from a, from a market interest. And that's why we sent out the uh, the one on Bryant-Denny Stadium this week, and then we're sending out one uh, next week on Coleman Coliseum and how that impacts our, our men's and women's basketball programs as well as our gymnastics programs. And so that's that's how those things got put together. And I think one of the things that's out there is, you know, we, we – threw out a lot of different choices and a lot of different amenities and say, you know, would this interest you or would this not interest you? Uh, and that doesn't mean we're going to go out and do every single thing that we put on there, but it, it gives a good understanding of where, where interest may lie on different amenities that could come in the future. And that's why we, uh, we wanted to get out there and, and try to get some feedback from everybody on it. We're talking to Greg Byrne, the athletic director of the University of Alabama, uh, let me ask you, when you look at uh, some of the things that you're hearing, the early feedback, what are some of those things that you're hearing back? Well, I actually, I think we're over 3,000 uh, responses so far. That was as of this morning, so it may have gone up by now. Um, I actually haven't reviewed one of them yet, so it, it's actually too early for me to, to tell you on that. What we have been doing is is uh, having different conversations with when we go out and have donor visits, our development staff and just saying, hey, there may be some things ahead, and that's with uh, you know donors of all levels. Uh, that could be somebody that's uh, sitting up on the on the east side with, with two season tickets or somebody that's obviously sitting in a skybox, and what what does that look like? But it's, a, it's important to get that feedback across the board, and there's no way, obviously, physically with our staff that we can get out and get to every single person individually. And so it's, it's, this gives the opportunity for for a wide variety of people and with different backgrounds, the opportunity to weigh in and, and give their two cents. The tax-free form a couple of months ago that was passed is going to change athletics in a lot of different ways. I know that you're taking a proactive approach. Discuss that, how that impacts and how you're trying to plan ahead to kind of calculate that in. Well, it, it, it certainly has a major impact on the, on the short term. Um, annual contributions, you know, are no longer uh, deductible if they're seating benefits or other benefits tied to it. Now, what we don't know and what we're going to need from a ruling standpoint at some point, as will a, a bunch of other universities and, and charitable organizations, is if you give a capital gift, so separate from an annual gift, and, and that goes towards uh, the improvement of facilities or, or something, you know, scholarships or something to help out uh, the enterprise, so to speak, is that still is, is that deductible for you? And and nobody really has that answer at this point. So at some point we're gonna we're certainly hopeful that we're gonna get a ruling from uh, the IRS that saying here here's where it is. And you know I certainly hope when it comes to uh, a, a, a capital contribution that's separate from where somebody gives you know maybe it's five hundred dollars for a donation for a seat that that can still be deductible because. We have our infrastructure at our facilities at, at universities all across the country, and and understandably, except for in, in a few select uh, circumstances, the you know the federal government, the state government are are not going to come in and try to help you keep those facilities up and renovated and all the things that they need in time, and so the the deductibility from a charitable contribution was the one of the ways we could get some help in that process. 
give the donor a benefit, and then at the same time to move our program forward. And and so we're you know, we we've had a few different conversations already where there's been some people who were involved in uh, the tax reform that was created that said you know I'm not sure I don't think that was necessarily in, the intent of it was to take away those types of contributions. And so we're hopeful at some point we can get a ruling that would would uh, uh, would, would be favorable from that position. And so but. During that time until there is a ruling, we don't want to sit still and twiddle our thumbs. We want to make sure we're doing everything we can to move the program forward. And so that's why we decided to go out with the surveys at the time that we did. We're talking to Athletic Director from the University of Alabama, Greg Byrne, right here on The Game in Tuscaloosa and Tide 1029. Coach, a couple of weeks ago, there was a story that was uh, leaked out, or not leaked out, but it was from the University of Tennessee. And I thought one of the fascinating pieces was we had a reporter on up there and it was the coaching metrics that you had helped Tennessee and Nick Saban had helped. And obviously, Jeremy Pruitt, you want to see guys under you become successful and someone who played football here at the University of Alabama. Can you talk about those coaching metrics and the analytics that you guys are compiling uh, to evaluate the efficiency in head coaches in football? Well, yeah, that, that obviously got a little bit of attention. And, and uh, you know, a couple things to that. First of all, John John Curry, their eight, eight, former AD, and I've been friends for almost 25 years and so he and I were talking and and what happens from AD to AD there's there's often a lot of conversations obviously you want to be very respectful of the rivalries I think that's that's obviously very important it's one of the most special things about college sports and uh, and so he said hey I was trying to compile some of this and I'm just getting pulled in a lot of different directions and I said hey I've got some information that's certainly not uh, proprietary and there's there's things that we had in there that that were very general, and so we shared. We just shared some of that information uh, with him at that time. But you know, one of the things is, as an AD, and I and I've done this for multiple sports, is you will always want to understand where the markets are going and, and trends in the market from a positive and negative standpoint. And so, um, we actually analyze that and and uh, and pay attention to that on a regular basis, as do some of my peers as well. And and so that's something that uh, I found helpful for me when it's come time to analyze where the market is from a coaching standpoint. And it certainly didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out who the best coach in the country is, and that's uh, that's obviously our very own Coach Saban. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Listen, I didn't take it as negative. I took it as positive. I mean, it's to me, it's brilliant. I mean, that's what we talked about it from that standpoint. I mean, sure, but we need Tennessee to get back to uh, – uh, we need that third Saturday of October, and I don't, I don't want you to comment on that because you'll get yourself in a little bit of trouble. But uh, <laughs> but we we need that third Saturday of October. We'd love to to get that game back to it. Means a lot. So let me go back. You were hired, if I've got my date correct, January the seventh, sixteenth of two thousand seventeen. I'm just curious how your perception of coming into the program around Nick Saban, working with him now for what fifteen, sixteen months, how your perception has changed. Well, I had I had great respect for him uh, on the outside. I, I I certainly had been following and reading about him for a long time. I, I had been around him some from my past SEC days, uh, but I can tell you now. You know, I guess we're starting to look at a year and a half into it. He's he's been incredible, and um, he is uh, you know the focus and the drive, all those things you, that we all have read and know about him certainly are true. Uh, but you know, I've come to really appreciate the the way the, the guys on the team love playing for him, having him be his co- their coach. Uh, the the just the ability he has to lead uh, Alabama football, but beyond that, the impact that he's had on our athletic department and our university and our community and state. And he and Miss Terry both. And uh, you know, it's something where I, I've said this in a lot of the speeches I make. We 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 have incredible history at Alabama. And at the same time, too, we are under historical times right now, too. And we, first of all, not need to take that for granted by any stretch. But secondly, we also have to do everything we can to continue to move the program forward on a, on a daily, monthly, yearly basis. So, one, we can continue to perform at the levels that, uh, that we all want to be a part of. And, and so as the AD, as you can imagine, that's something that uh, – you know that I spend a decent amount of time on with our staff, and we've got great support from President Bell and our trustees, and has some really incredible supporters of all levels. And that's that's uh, one of the things that separates Alabama. And I said this, I think I may have said this even when I first got here, 
But I think Alabama is the best institution in the country where everybody's pulling the rope in the same direction. Uh, for academically, athletically, alumni-wise, former letter winners, uh, you know, the, the Joe, you know, Joe fan off the street who's a big Alabama fan too, and, and that's that's a separator for us. And so we we uh, need to continue to take advantage of that and and do everything we can to, to continue to put ourselves in the best position long term. What does it mean to you when you walk through the hallway and you see all these NFL superstars? And, and obviously we're going to build with, with Colin Sexton announcing a day and the NBA guys, but so many of the alums from the athletic side of things walk through that building and return and training the offseason, the publicity that Alabama gets from – you know, guys like Julio Jones walking through the hallway. Yeah, I mean, I mean, hey, as a guy that's been in athletics my entire life, I, you know, I was down and walking through the training room, I don't know, t- two days ago, and Julio's in there hanging out. And, and I hadn't met him yet, so I, I went up and introduced myself to him. And one of the things I said to him is I said, I am so glad that you're here, that you come back. What, a, what an incredible reflection on you, on Coach Saban, on the program on everybody associated with it, and uh, and he was great about it. Uh, and so that's the environment you want to have. I, I, I've got a picture here in my office of Regina, my wife, and I with Joe Namath when he sat with us at a game this year. And, you know, as a kid, just admiring the heck out of him, and, and he couldn't have been a better guy and, and more humble and approachable. And how much, And then on top of that, how much he loves being here and being a part of it. And that's, a, that's an incredible reflection on everybody tied to our program. So, you know, I... I I'm I, in a lot of ways you're just you're amazed by it and you appreciate it and you and again just back to where I talked about the successes we have you don't want to take that for granted and you want to continue to do everything you can to to this being the kind of place that everybody wants to be around and be a part of uh, whether they're a, a recruit whether they're a current student athlete whether they're an alum and then and on top of that from a fan base standpoint too and you know part of why we're looking at our facilities is we know how people consume athletics is changing, and I think it's really important that we we look at what that means. I mean, and I may have said this to you before, Ryan, that it kind of took me back a little bit. We went and toured Lambeau Field in the fall, and uh, one of the things they did is with uh, you know their end zone area on the top of Lambeau Field, they created a platform club with no seats. People just stand there and watch the game, and uh, you know that's that how people consume has become much more social, uh, not only face-to-face communication, but also from a technology standpoint. And that's important to uh, to be able to pay attention to and look and say, okay, what, what are some things we'd like to do long-term with some of those things? Can I can I run through two, two more questions here? I don't want to push you over the time, but I'd love to be able to slip in two more questions if possible. Sure. All right. Let me ask you, is there a new – even on the table as a discussion point for a new basketball facility, or are you really looking at – Maybe renovate in Coleman Coliseum. Well, we're 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 looking at both and trying to understand what our options are. Okay. And and what I can tell you is obviously one we got to be able to to pay for whatever we do and and you know that's that's not as easy as you know what you maybe think it is that there there'll be a significant investment. But let's say we build a new arena. What does that look like? Time frames, cost, all those things. What kind of what kind of capacity could we get? And and compare that if we did a a complete renovation of Coleman, a, a partial renovation of Coleman. I, whatever we do, though, I want to make sure we do it right and set our program up for the next 30 to 40 years. Um, at my previous institution, we renovated the basketball arena there, and when you walked into it, it looked like a brand new arena. And uh, and so, you know, that that does happen at some places, and then other places decide the best thing because maybe the bones of the facility and issues with the facility that is better to to build new. And so that's part of the process we've been going through right now. It seems like what we're seeing so far, though, is that, that the bones of Coleman are good. There's a lot of positives with it. There's there's a lot of a lot of seating issues, though, within the bowl um, that at some point we're going to we're gonna have to address, and that's either with building a new arena or renovating it. Greg Byrne, final couple of seconds here with him. Let me ask you one of the questions that we get up, and we've asked this question a couple of weeks ago. What would you like to see increase the fan experience inside Bryant Diddy Stadium? Wi-Fi is one of the top ones that we hear all the time. Wi-Fi, better cell reception. That sounds so minor to many of us, but uh, 
very important to those fans inside Bryant Denny Stadium. Yeah, it is. It, it, the, the cell reception is something that has actually improved. It has. Uh, in the last few years, there has been a, a, a pretty good investment in that, and there's actually some discussions about some future things with that as well. Uh, Wi-Fi is a uh, is is a is a big uh, big nut to to uh, get your arms around, and so uh, part of what we're looking at with the survey is is understanding um, is trying to get continue to get a better understanding of that. Which again, I don't think it takes a rocket scientist to figure out that that is important. And so when we look at what we want to do um, with Bryant Denny Stadium, that's going to be absolutely high on the list of priorities for us. Uh, it's also a very expensive priority, but it's something that we're going to need to figure out how to make happen. And I hope we can do that sooner than later. But I also don't want to say it'll be here next year or the year after because I, I, right now I can't promise that. Greg Byrne, Athletic Director at the University of Alabama. Thank you again for spending some time with us here on a Friday afternoon. I hope you have a great weekend. You betcha. Thanks so much and roll tide.